This is the first of what I hope will be a series. I don't claim to have any special knowledge or expertise. I do not have a PhD and I have not been published in any journal. I am just a filmmaker who, absent the creation of a work of my own that might have some lasting importance, wishes to at least pass along some of my thoughts about the films that have mattered to me most. For this first entry, I have chosen The Passion of Joan of Arc, directed by Carl Dreyer, starring René Falconetti, and released in 1928. It is a film of many miracles, from the total creative freedom gifted its director, to the revelatory performance of Falconetti, to the circumstances of its discovery and restoration. What is most miraculous about this film and what I will discuss is that there are two completely separate cuts of this film that give us incredible insight into the creative process of Dreher and Falconetti. First, some background. The Passion of Joan of Arc premiered in Copenhagen on the 21st of April, 1928, and subsequently in Paris on October 25th. But barely a month later, the camera negative was destroyed in a vault fire this was a potentially catastrophic turn of events for what was a costly film to produce. But Dreher had over 80,000 feet of unused footage that had been stored elsewhere, and he set about creating a new cut of the film using alternate takes. But as 1928 yielded to 1929, sound was rapidly taking over, and the commercial prospects for Joan of Arc dimmed rapidly. It was soon written off as a box office flop and quickly disappeared from view. However, a few individuals remained interested in this film, and its legend among cinephiles grew. In the 1950s, a film critic named Loduca uncovered a copy of the second version of the film, the one Dreyer had recreated from all those unused takes. He added music and subtitles to the film and touted its rediscovery. Dreyer disowned it as a bastardization of his work. But for years, it was the only way that most could access Dreyer's work and the famous performance of its lead. That is, until 1981, when a copy of the original version was found in the closet of a Norwegian hospital. It is this version that is now available through the Criterion Collection, Masters of Cinema, and Janus Films. And it is thanks to that discovery that we can compare these two versions to get a glimpse into the creative process of Dreyer and Falconetti to see the difference between the takes they deemed best and were used for the first cut and those which were merely second best and relegated for use in the second cut. First, a technical note. My copy of the second version was sourced from a 16 millimeter print, optically reduced from 35 millimeter. In so doing, a portion of the picture area was apparently cropped. So in order to have a true one-to-one -one comparison, I've resized the frame area. I thought it best to begin with the first shot after the credits sequence. It's an elegant tracking shot, unusual for its length, considering the rapid pacing of the rest of the film. Comparing the two takes of this shot, it immediately becomes apparent the degree to which Dreyer exerted control over every movement and action on screen. The shot used for the first cut is longer, Dreyer evidently favoring its slightly more sedate pace. For the sake of comparison, I have slowed the second take roughly 25%. Note the actions of the individual actors. A theologian takes his seat. A guard walks with a stool and places it down. 
a scribe approaches the tribunal. There is a remarkable degree of parity between the two shots, the choreography of every actor as precise as a dance. The only major variation seems to be the pacing. When Dreher created the new version of the film, he stated his goal was to create a cut that, to those unfamiliar, would seem identical to the original. And he largely succeeds, apparently using a surviving work print or answer print of the first cut as a template, because the editing is precise and nearly identical to the first version. The only difference is that these are alternate takes, but the timing is remarkable, as is the rhythm. But it is not an exact copy, and Dreyer always mourned this fact, stating that he could spot the differences between his preferred cut and the supposedly inferior second cut. It has been said that during the production, Dreyer and his actress, Falconetti, reviewed the day's takes to decide which were best and how she might hone her performance. Is this difference apparent? Consider this subtle shot during the sequence in the torture room. Jeanne is asked to show her interrogators respect as wise men, but she argues that God is wiser still. The two takes of the scene reveal different shadings for the performance. In the second cut, Falconetti telegraphs a greater look of fervor, verging almost on the maniacal. She seems a woman possessed. She dialed back this emotion for another take. A wise decision, I think. This take was used in the first cut. This take, used in the first cut, has greater impassivity it suggests that her knowledge of God is deeper, more personal, and something beyond expression in language. Though Dreyer is a controlling director, he was not unwilling to revise scenes while on set. Consider this tracking shot of townspeople watching the execution. In the second cut, Lit candles in their hands are prominent. Dreyer seems to have had second thoughts about this strategy. And for the first cut, the candles are much less prominent, favoring subtle over overt religiosity. There are other times where the second cut definitely suffers in terms of quality when compared to the first cut. The famous scene in which Jen's hair is trimmed suffers greatly because in that instance the scene could only be done once, so the second cut had to rely upon unused scraps. And then there are some strange moments. Consider this scene when a townsperson voices his support of Jeanne and is quickly manhandled by the English guards. In the first cut, he is bound and thrown into the waters, presumably left to drown. In the second cut, this take is played in reverse. It's unclear if this is a printing error or if this was done by intent on Dreyer's part. It is known that there were some major questions as to whether the film would be accepted in Great Britain. Some deemed its tones to be overtly anti-English. Could this reverse scene have been an effort to obscure some of the more overt actions of the English against the French to obfuscate the film's messaging? It's hard to say. Ultimately, as Dreyer's authorized cut, the first cut must be accepted as the definitive version of this film. But the second cut has great value as well, and for those who love this film, 
they would do well to seek out the second cut of the film as well, to compare the two for themselves. Both cuts can be obtained on the Masters of Cinema Blu-ray or DVD release in the UK. In the United States, through the Criterion Collection, you can buy a DVD of the original cut, and a new restoration is touring with Janus Films. And if you want to learn more about René Falconetti, Mirko Stopar has made a wonderful documentary called Nitrate Flames that should be available soon. Thank you very much, and I look forward to doing many more of these in the future.